always has been. Okay, thank you all for coming. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very excited today to have the master's thesis defense for Rob Ritson. So Rob came to us from Penn State University. Uh, he then spent a couple of years uh, working different technician jobs, including working for one of my old former bosses, um, John Spires, with uh, the Rocky Mountain Research Station out of Missoula, doing some link stuff. And so he's here to talk to you today about some really awesome work that he did on bison spatial ecology. Um, this should result in two really great publications that I'm very excited for that he's going to talk to you about both of those. Um, then Rob also had, during his time here, what I refer to as his second thesis, uh, which was focused on wildlife responses to solar eclipse. Um, and that has resulted in one publication already, um, and he has another one in the works. And so he'll walk out of here with four pups, and I'm really proud of Rob and how hard he's worked and how much he's learned, and it's really an incredible testament to his hard work and effort to learn how to do all these different analyses. And, um, and I, I'm just incredibly proud of him and all the work that he's done. And so uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Rob. Thank you very much, Dustin. Uh, so like Dustin said, uh, my thesis really focused on the spatial ecology of bison. Um, like, unlike most other grad students where you have um, a species that you're you know, going out into the field a lot, you get to actually observe and handle them sometimes. I was kind of in a unique position where I was really kind of chained to the computer downstairs. Uh, so I was really looking at just the data, but this really was a really interesting data set for able to answer some questions that no one's really looked at at the scale um, that we did before. But in order to make that possible, uh, I'd first like to thank uh, all the people that contributed the data uh, to give me a project to work on. Uh, all across the United States, I'd like to thank my committee members for uh, their involvement uh, in helping me out to figure out some of these uh, spatial analyses and uh, some advice along the way. And then uh, part of this work was funded by the UNK Research Services Council. So first of all, a little bit of background on bison. Um, they're one of the largest mammals in North America. And not only that, they occupied one of their one of the widest niches. Uh, they've been found every arche both archaeological evidence as well as direct historical accounts. Uh, from the arid steppe down in southwest uh, United States all the way up to the Intermountain Forest. Uh, so it's a really wide diversity of habitat that they've been found in uh, to occupy. And how they use the landscape is they're the really intensive grazers. Uh, um, they really prefer uh, nutritious grass, uh, preferentially uh, to other species that are around. So they're really kind of keying in on that high productivity. And all this kind of equates to uh, some research that's starting to support that maybe they occupy this keystone role in the Great, in the great Plains. Um, their intensive grazing uh, really manipulated these vegetation, um, vegetation patterns uh, throughout the Great Plains. Uh, they're really large animals, so they do a lot of rubbing and wallowing and things like that, really mechanically disturbing the landscape. And this has uh, benefits for uh, soil cycling, nutrient cycling, um, their manure supported, you know, further uh, fluxes of nutrients, uh, carcasses, fed scavengers, as well as cycling back into the soil. Uh, they suppressed woody, woody vegetation to maintain these wide open uh, grasslands. And this had a lot of benefits uh, for arthropods, small mammals, and uh, grassland birds as well. So prior to European settlement, uh, there was an estimated 30 million bison uh, in North America. And this was really part of, part of the reason why they played such an important role was their numbers. They were large animals and there was a lot of them. And they were really, they really intensively used the landscape. Uh, however, uh, Europeans uh, came in and it was really just a, a massive slaughter of bison. It really cut back the population uh, almost to extinction. Uh, this picture shows a mountain of bison skulls uh, at a fertilizer factory in the Midwest. Uh, this guy is standing on uh, a single bison skull. So you can just imagine the numbers of bison that were slaughtered during this period. However, um, some preeminent uh, conservationists with names like William T. Hornaday, Charles M. Goodnight, kind of took it upon themselves with these private enterprises to bring in the last remaining bison that they could find to prevent them from blinking out altogether. Uh, and to them, 
Uh, this was all that was needed, just keep them alive and we're, we're successful. And it was uh, declared that uh, we saved bison from, from extinction. Uh, but they're really limited with the, um, the tools of the time. To them, they, were, uh, they treated them just like cattle. That's all they knew was just these animal husbandry techniques. And this really predated uh, conservation as a profession as we understand it today. They weren't really focusing in on the ecological role, the ecology um, uh, of bison. So that's kind of led to some more research today that's really kind of questioning, are they really a success? Maybe they near, there needs to be more uh, to be done uh, to really address the ecology of bison, not just uh, sustaining that population. Uh, so today, uh, there's over half a million bison alive in North America. However, uh, about 20,000 of those uh, are what we call in conservation herds. So these are individuals that are not in commercial production, not what you eat um, at Ted's uh, Cafe in Bozeman, but it's bison that exists uh, like at the Crane Trust, where uh, they're not really in production, they're just there uh, for the ecological benefit, for the aesthetic benefit. Uh, so that's what uh, these circles represent. Uh, the larger circles indicate larger population sizes, the smaller ones obviously smaller populations. And then this whole kind of shaded region is estimated um, where they occupied prior um, to European settlement. Um, and so again, uh, that 20,000 that are in conservation herds represents less than 2% of what we uh, consider to be their historic abundance. So there's really really not that many bison uh, compared to how much there were previously. And then, uh, quick highlighted here, uh, there are the areas that we're going to focus on um, in my analysis, but I'll get to those in a minute. So, uh, bison conservation is really characterized, at least historically, by really intensive management. Uh, things that really benefited them uh, from uh, preventing their extinction altogether is actually working against them today. So. They're in small, isolated herds. This was good to prevent disease spread. Uh, however, now we are, we're looking at um, geni the genetic health is not where, really where it should be. Uh, they're starting to bottleneck. Uh, they're kept at high population densities. This was to encourage breeding so they could get more numbers to keep them from uh, falling into that extinction spiral. Uh, but it's really ecologically damaging for the landscape. Remember I said they're intensive grazers, so they like to use um, they're really hard on the landscape. They evolved to not use it hard, but to prevent permanent damage to then move on. So it's really damaging to keep them at this high density. And then frequent inter uh, human interactions uh, had the benefit of being able to vaccinate them, take blood samples, again, prevent uh, disease and uh, uh, maintain their health. However, now they're desensitized to humans, uh, which takes away from, from their wildness. They might be uh, acting more like cattle now rather than a wild bison. So this has declared some researchers uh, to declare them ecologically extinct. They're much smaller than they were historically as far as population is concerned. Uh, they're all uh, fragmented, isolated into small populations. They're not really fulfilling the role uh, that they that they evolved in. Uh, really this is, uh, we believe this is really boiling down to just scale. Like I said, uh, they, re they require a lot of space. Uh, they're seeking out the best available resources, and if uh, they're prevented from moving on, they're just going to use that same space uh, at that same intensity, and eventually that's going to, to lead to uh, permanent damage on the landscape. So these, these management practices could be limiting this natural tendency. So moving forward, uh, we think bison conservation good Bison conservation goals uh, should consider uh, this ecological approach. Uh, there are obviously a lot of socio-political constraints to bison restoration. However, we think that we need to add this ecological component, at least to be considered in the mix uh, when managing bison. So it really kind of boils down to this question, how much space do we need to replicate uh, these interactions um, in both an ecological and evolutionarily meaningful way? So I'm going to talk to you guys about um, uh, two chapters, um, seasonal spatial patterns of bison. Uh, we were, this was more focused on uh, absolute magnitude of space that they were using, as well as variations in resource selection across their former range. 
Uh, so let me introduce you to our bison herds. Uh, first, we have the Henry Mountains down in southern Utah. Uh, this is managed by the Utah Department of Wildlife Resources. Um, they're fairly, they're maintained at this fairly small 325. Uh, is their uh, management goal. Uh, they're hunted annually. Uh, however, they exist on public land. There's no fences, and they're pretty much as wild as it gets outside of Yellowstone. Uh, the next herd is Bookless, also in Utah, same management agency. However, uh, adjacent to this herd is a tribal herd uh, that's much larger, not as genetically pure, and there's a lot of overlap between these herds. So it's really hard to tell how many bison are actually in this herd and how, how uh, wild they are, how pure the genetics are. Um, so a little bit um, uh, more intensively managed. Next we have the American Prairie Reserve. Uh, probably uh, one of the newer herds on the list. Uh, they're a non-government organization with the explicit goal of uh, uh, protecting uh, grasslands in North America. And they reintroduced this bison herd to uh, kind of contribute to those ecological processes. Uh, they're up to about 860 bison. However, there's still a lot of internal fences, internal pastures that have been uh, acquired the deeds to really make a contiguous area yet. So it's still fairly isolated, but they're, they're moved between these pastures. Next we have Madonna Zapata Ranch down in southern Colorado. Uh, this used to be a commercial herd that has since been taken over by a nature conservancy. Uh, very high population density, about 1,500 bison uh, over a fairly small 153 square kilometer area. And then we have Cap Rock Canyons State Park. This houses the Texas State Bison Herd, uh, managed by uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife. Uh, it's a fairly small herd, again, um, also uh, fenced as well. So getting into our spatial analysis, uh, we really had two main objectives here. Uh, we were trying to compare the space use between these free-range bison, which were the Henry Mountains and Book Cliffs, and compare those uh, to the management regimes of APR, uh, Madonna's After Ranch, and Cap Rock Canyons, which were uh, at least fenced bison, so some form of uh, management on the landscape. Uh, we did this at two spatial scales, uh, that'll explain it a bit, and three temporal scales. And then we assessed uh, ecological influences uh, of the patterns that we were observing. So the scales we looked at, um, we used spatial data for 73 individuals. Uh, this was collected between 2005 and 2018. It really varied on the particular herd. Um, some were collected earlier, some more recently. Uh, so the data was uh, fairly variable in that regards. Uh, we, we calculated home range using autocorrelated kernel density estimators. And then as a slightly smaller scale, uh, we decided to look at patch size. And we did this using first passage time analysis. So autocorrelated kernel density estimators really allowed us to uh, kind of go beyond the fences based on their movement patterns, how much space would they use if those fences weren't there. So uh, with the free range bison uh, over here, uh, that's, a, that's an AKDE kernel. Uh, and what it's really doing is it's fitting a movement model and not only uh, predicting the area that it's actually using, but actually uh, going where could it have gone. Uh, and then with your captive bison, we have very hard lines here uh, where the fences were present. And the kernel goes beyond that because based on those movements, it's trying to predict where could it have gone. And then the next scale we looked at was first passage time. So we're scaling more down into the actual GPS location. So these are our GPS locations uh, of the actual movement track of the bison. Uh, see more straight line movement uh, away from resources and then they kind of get more tortuous when there's uh, forage present and then uh, more straight line as they go to the next patch. So in order to assess this uh, we have a moving window of circles of varying um, diameter and what we're looking at is the variance so the number of uh, locations within that circle at a particular time. Uh, so I can play it again real quick. Uh, this first one, we have the most variability. It's really matching that patch size. Uh, and then the smaller one, uh, it's a little bit too small. You have pretty much one or two in there at any given time. And then the last one, uh, there's way more bison in there. 
Uh, so both the, first, the last two had low variance, whereas that first one had the most variance um, in locations. Now we looked at three temporal scales. We, we uh, considered annual to be at least 10 months of location data. It really varied on the particular individual. Um, and then we uh, looked at growing season and non-growing season, uh, which we defined by uh, normalized difference vegetation index, or NDVI. And what this does, it just measures the greenness on the landscape, which research supports is really heavily correlated with the biomass that's present. So we defined when that, that green up started and when it ended was the growing season, uh, which would be here, and then non-growing season were the periods that occurred outside of that period. And then the actual statistical analysis, we compared um, space use between management type and seasons. So between the management types, free range and captive, and then between our growing and non-growing seasons using Kruskal Wallace test. And then we modeled ecological patterns of our covariates here, uh, generalized linear mixed models. Uh, we used a gamma error distribution, and all this means is we had positive home ranges and first patch of time can't be negative. Space is always positive, and all of these predictors are always positive, so we set origin as we could, we could not have negative predictors, is all that was doing. And then we set a random effect for herd. Uh, this is assuming that individuals from the same herd are going to use space more similarly to each other, and that the ecological um, uh, measurements are all going to be more similar to each other. Uh, so our, our results from this analysis, as you can see, uh, also our y-axis here is mean area, so this is our home range in square kilometers. Then our x-axis is our seasons, annual growing and non-growing. Uh, free range is our, our pale boxes, and then captive is the darker boxes. And you can clearly see uh, we had uh, significant um, statistical results that free range bison were using a lot more space uh, than captive bison were. Um, but this should be fairly self evident. But the, the important part that we found was space use actually varied by season between our free range herds. Uh, whereas you don't see a, a significant relationship between uh, seasonal use for the captive bison. First passage time, uh, there were no uh, significant uh, differences between our management types of free range or captive, um, and nor did it vary by season either. So it was fairly consistent um, uh, across uh, seasons and um, management type. And I just wanted to highlight here, um, our home range sizes are actually uh, very similar to the amount of space that was available to the bison at the time. Uh, for home range, and we had a similar pattern for first passage time as well. Uh, this first passage time is really approaching that amount of available space. There's actually previous research that's showing that um, in similar herds, uh, the, the, this is a thing with, um, with captive bison. They're really using all that space available, and really it's just becoming, rather than a home range, it's becoming more of a foraging patch. Uh, Adonis after ranch, we didn't really see this pattern, however, we had really low sample sizes, so uh, this would require uh, further research to figure out what's going on uh, with this particular herd. And then for ecological covariates, uh, we fit uh, the general linear models uh, for each season, and then I ranked them by their relative importance within the model. Uh, all, all three uh, seasonal models contain precipitation, uh, overall, relatively similar patterns, uh, annual, um, tended, uh, annual and growing season, we tended to have um, at higher, higher measurements of precipitation and millimeter, we tended to have lower estimates of home range. Uh, however, uh, non-growing season, we tended to have uh, the highest predicted home ranges at intermediate levels of precipitation. Next, we had canopy cover in both annual and non-growing season models. Uh, fairly similar patterns taking place here. Uh, at denser canopy, they were using less space. Uh, this could be related to the fact that they're grazers, so they're really kind of avoiding these, uh, these dense canopies. And then landscape ruggedness um, was in both uh, growing and non-growing season. Uh, it makes sense. Uh, so as ruggedness increases, that means there's more heterogeneity in the landscape, which means that they could be more costly to move through. So it's a possibility that they're moving around obstacles, which is 
increasing the total amount of movement that they're that they're actually uh, the total amount of space that they're using. But the really important part here was uh, anthropogenic uh, uh, covariates were the most important in both our annual and growing season models. Uh, annually, road distance, uh, the closer the, they tended to use less space, the further they were from roads. Uh, this could, we're not really sure what's going on here, but it could be uh, related to the fact that um, fences are artificially kind of constraining them to be close to roads. Um, however, it could have, um, they could also be um, just re responding to, to that human uh, uh, presence as well. And then with the growing season, we had a pretty uh, interesting relationship here where uh, home rate size was being predicted to, to increase as more space was becoming available, uh, which seems fairly self-evident, but it's a really, really cool finding. And then our seasonal first passage time models, uh, they weren't really, really explanatory at all. Uh, we didn't really have much of a, a relationship here. Our annual and non-growing season, uh, the null models were ranked fairly high, so within two AIC of our top models. So we weren't really comfortable uh, with the predictions of those top models. Uh, it seemed that the random effect of herd explained the variations that we were observing better than the ecological predictors could. Uh, growing season, we did have a top model. Um, however, similar to the, the previous model where ruggedness and precipitation uh, had more of a, a, a quadratic uh, relationship with uh, uh, first passage time. So overall, free range bison use more space than captive bison, which uh, shouldn't really come as a surprise if you take the fences down. They're going to move and they're going to use more space. Um, but the really important part here was the seasonal changes. Uh, Free-range bison uh, were responding to the landscape based on temporal availability of resources, or at least that's what uh, seems to suggest. And overall, first passage time, this uh, uh, perception of the landscape was similar across herds, and this suggests that a bison is just being a bison no matter where it is, no matter what habitat it's occupying. Uh, that's, that seems to be a fairly constant um, characteristic of all, all the herds. And what does this mean for management? Uh, this means that the fencing uh, present in the vast majority of bison herds uh, could be affecting their ability uh, to naturally uh, use the landscape. Uh, this could be, um, it's really suppressing these natural tendencies. Um, and this could be satisfied uh, by potentially increasing the space you can still have the fences present, but it needs to be, a, it should it appears that it should be large enough to at least allow seasonal use of space. Uh, our recommendation of 1,200 square kilometers is simply because the only herd that we observed this phenomenon in was the Henry Mountains. They're known to seasonally migrate, so uh, we think research should at least, this is a good place to start, that at, at, at minimum 1,200 square kilometers we're observing migration, so maybe, um, possibly, using that as a starting point for the, no, the amount of space that they need. And then free, future work should kind of look at the distribution of space use as well as a little bit more finer uh, how these ecological characteristics are influencing it. And then we're going to move on here to resource selection. So we're kind of scaling down past home range, past foraging size into the particular habitats that they're using uh, within that defined home range. Uh, so we're the main thing we're doing here is comparing this habitat selection uh, between uh, the management types, so the free range and captive, uh, as well as uh, they're all occur they are all are occupying different um, ecological areas uh, across their former range. So we want to see how it's relating to not only the management but where they're located on the landscape. Uh, so some quick background on resource selection. Uh, there's four orders of selection. Uh, the first order here uh, is the entire range distribution of a species. So the entire area in which you find, for example, bison. Uh, that is you know, first order selection, where they appear on the landscape. Second order, where an animal chooses to put its home range within that, that distribution. So where that individual uh, places that home range, second order selection. Third order selection is 
uh, focusing more on the habitats within that home range that they're preferring to use, followed by forage preference, which is your fourth order selection, more of fine scale uh, vegetation uh, preferences for forage. Uh, so what we're going to focus on is this third order selection of habitat, and we use the use availability framework. So based on where where bison GPS location was on the landscape, uh, how is that um, used in proportion to its availability? Uh, and the kind of theoretical framework we used here was this idea of a refugee species. Uh, so. A refugee species is when a particular species range has been constricted um, and they could be restricted to sub-optimal habitats at that, at, at that point, and which could further reduce their fitness. So we wanted to take this idea and see, are bison in the Great Plains a refugee? Are they using habitat that's suitable to them? Or are, we, are they just there because we put them there? So we did this. Um, we've redefined available space, so instead of doing individual home ranges, we calculated a single herd wide home range using a minimum convex polygon, which all it does is it takes all the data and it draws um, this geometric shape around all the data, in this case 99% of the data, and then we buffered it with a medium step length, so how far uh, successive points were from each other, that median uh, was our buffer. And then captive bison, uh, we just use the pasture unit uh, with, under the assumption that we're spending all their time there and if they escape, they're not, they're not escaped for long. They're spending all their time behind that fence. And then we generated five available points for every use point uh, within the data sets. And it looks something like this. Uh, we were able to use a lot more of the data uh, that was contributed to us because we didn't have the assumptions of home range. So all we needed was that location as a known point of where they occurred on the landscape. So this resulted in a, a lot more uh, individuals. Uh, statistical analysis, uh, really all we did here was a generalized linear mix of effects regression. Uh, we did this with, uh, for each herd, so we had uh, five herd specific models. This included a random effect by individual. Uh, you'd expect individuals uh, to use resources similarly to themselves. Uh, and, then we, and then we did a pool model. So we took all that data together uh, to see kind of these underlying uh, patterns if we, if we assessed it all at once. And for that model, we included an additional random effect of study area. We expected individuals from the same place to use resources to support it. And we, used, we measured these habitat characteristics uh, for those models. Uh, so getting into the results here, we have Hunter Mountains, Book Cliffs, APR, Madano, Cap Rock Canyons, and then all uh, water distance, uh, similar uh, relationships uh, taking place here. Uh, generally, um, they, were they were preferring to be closer to water. Um, however, we have some kind of secondary selection taking place uh, with Henry Mountains and Madonna Zapka Ranch. Um, and then book lifts even seem to prefer uh, to be farther. But in general, uh, most of the herds, uh, they, they seem to be liking to be closer to water. Uh, roads, uh, really good agreement with book cliffs and our captive herds. However, Henry Mountains is kind of our outlier. Uh, the captive herds and book cliffs, they prefer to be really close to roads, uh, whereas Henry Mountains, we found, were actually avoiding them. Uh, NDVI, uh, it was not included in the top model for Henry Mountains. However, the remaining herds tended to use uh, the highest amount of the most productive areas available on the landscape. However, boat cliffs was a little different. They seem to be selecting more intermediate um, greenness on the landscape. And then we had canopy cover, uh, really good agreement between all these herds. Um, they were preferring uh, to avoid these denser canopies uh, and prefer these more open areas, which could be related to the, uh, their foraging strategy. They like the grasses. Uh, and they don't like woody species, so they're avoiding those, those dense canopies. And then we have elevation. A um, little bit more variable. Uh, in general, with Henry Mountains and APR, they were using the higher elevations uh, that were available in the landscape. Boat Cliffs, Madonna's Avalanche, and Caprock Canyons seem to be uh, preferring more of an intermediate elevation uh, that was available. 
really strong here. Uh, slope, they tended to avoid um, steep slopes, preferring more flat areas across all herds. Uh, landscape ruggedness, again, this is heterogeneity of the landscape uh, fairly consistently, um, preferring a really homogenous terrain, uh, some uh, areas that are pretty easy to walk through, not, not as rough, uh, not as rugged. Uh, this wasn't a significant wasn't significant for APR and wasn't included in McDonald's Outer Edge. Uh, overall, I ranked uh, the top three predictors for each of each of the models, so our herd and our pooled. And overall, elevation and slope uh, were consistently in the top three uh, influential predictors in all of our models. And overall, um, our patterns again were fairly similar across all the bison herds. And this is suggesting that they aren't refugee species. Uh, they aren't using suboptimal habitat because the selection between free range and captive is all fairly similar to each other. And we're kind of using the term uh, terrestrial castaway. They're, it's more of the isolation between these uh, and all the land use conflict in between them that's uh, preventing them from interacting with each other. Uh, so that seems to be the more important aspect rather than the habitat selection itself. And then the other really important point was uh, the roads were being avoided by the Henry Mountains. And I think this could be fairly easy explain, easily explained by the fact that they've been hunted the longest. Um, they are publicly hunted herd uh, since at least the 1950s. The remaining herds fenced. Uh, they don't have that kind of pressure, so they don't have kind of that fear factor going on. And actually, a previous study of uh, the Texas uh, herd down in Capra Canyons, uh, the more productive areas on the landscape actually correlated with road berms. So that could be another underlying feature why uh, some of these herds were preferring to be closer to roads. Uh, management implications. Uh, this uh, understanding resource selection for bison can really help us uh, figure out areas that are suitable for them in the future, uh, which could allow future work to not take these these resource preferences and kind of uh, add in these land use constraints in order to identify where could future um, conservation work happen on the Great Plains. So even though, say, Kearney, Nebraska, there's a lot of grassland around here, so uh, from the thousand foot view, it looks like, hey, this would be really great bison habitat. However, once you put in your land use constraints of all the agriculture and housing and things, all of a sudden it's, it's no longer suitable for them. So by kind of take, reconciling both these aspects, we can figure out areas in which um, we can um, put bison on the landscape. And really the main takeaway here uh, uh, is that bison, they really need this uh, sufficient amount of space uh, to respond to environmental variations. Uh, they don't all have to be free range. Uh, however, with these captive herds, um, the data is suggesting that maybe we should think about uh, moving these fences out a little bit, try to give them a little bit more space, and at least enough in which that they can respond to the uh, uh, yearly changes in the landscape and use uh, the most productive areas. Uh, so we encourage management practices uh, to, to really kind of induce these behaviors um, that are more evolutionarily and ecologically natural for bison. Uh, to help kind of realize these, these keystone roles that they play. And that'll take any questions. So, did you look at all about the genetic diversity between the herds, or how long that they've been distinct from each other? Do they intermix? Uh, I did not explicitly look at genetics, but there's a rich literature out there um, that has looked at the genetics of all these different herds. Uh, Henry Mountains is genetically pure. They were introduced in the 1940s from uh, with uh, bison brought in from Yellowstone. Uh, Oak Cliffs originally were pure. However, mixing with the Ute tribe bison with uncertain origin, it's not clear that that's the case anymore. Uh, uh, Caprock Canyon State Park down in Texas. They believe they have a subspecies of plains bison down there, however the literature is still kind of working that out, whether it's a subspecies or just they're so inbred that they're different from everything else. Uh, APR is fairly, uh, they're genetically pure as well, they've been very careful about where they're sourcing their bison, uh, Wind Cave National Park, Yellowstone, and a 
couple other birds. So they have a really good genetic mixture up there. Uh, but Donna's Apple Ranch, like I said, uh, if they were in commercial production, so they're, they're not genetically pure bison in that herd. So do you think any of that could be playing a role in the differences that you see in some of these weird, I mean, yeah. you know, just odd outliers? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it really could. Uh, we didn't really look at that explicitly because we don't have the genetic information for the individuals that we measured. We just know overall in the herd uh, what that history was, but we don't have the actual genetic information. But that would be uh, interesting research in the future. In chapter one, you said the movement did not differ from a random movement at one of the scales that was on one of your slides. It was within two EICs of randomness. Oh, so um, with the first passage time. Mm -hmm. uh, so our annual and growing and non-growing season models, um, we followed um, AIC to rank our top models. And our null model, which was nothing except the random effects, was ranked uh, less than two AIC from our top model. And using law of parsimony, uh, that means all those models, all those covariates weren't explaining anything better than the null. So we decided we didn't have enough confidence in those models to, to trust that those predictions. If they're moving randomly, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, well, it was... We're not sure if it's a good thing or a bad thing. It was more surprising. We were ex we weren't really sure what to expect at first passage time. We were expecting that possibly it could be related to the productivity of the landscapes in which they were occurring. But it was interesting that we're finding that uh, it really didn't it didn't really matter where they were. They were kind of all keying in on a similar patch patch selection. So it could be more of an inherent kind of. Uh, uh, characteristic of bison that they see the landscape and it's like, all right, I see you know x number of square kilometers, and that's that's what I'm using at a given time, whether or not they're north south. So. Can you back up one slide? I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. Can you help me get? I mean, the modeling. Yeah. Very, very impressive. Mm -hmm. How do you get from modeling? I, I'm, I'm looking at these messages. Mm -hmm. What's the response variable? Are we looking at mortality or animal growth or herd growth? So, help, me get, help me get from the modeling to, to this. To these, so the, our modeling was just, so in the case of the first chapter, the modeling was just absolute space use. We didn't look at how uh, home ranges um, varied in space. We were just doing how big was that home range in a particular season. Uh, future work, we're going to kind of key in on that a little bit more as far as were these home ranges moving around and they just kept it the same size, or was it... Um, or were they using that same spot all the time? Uh, these suggestions, um, because the Henry Mountains are migratory, they're following these spatial variations, whereas we're not seeing this in these management herds, there's a, there's a disconnect there. And we're not saying what exactly is causing it, but it's common denominator defenses could be the reason that they're not using uh, their given space very, in a temporally significant way. So I have a question then. Yep. Um, how do bison move? I mean, so if you have 384, mm -hmm. that's one of the numbers I remember. Okay. Are they all moving together? Are they so, in small yeah. herds? No, that's, a really, that's a really great how question. Have, um, so bison work? live in a fission fusion society. So uh, they have the entire herd, so the Henry Mountains herd, uh, that's that one single population there. But they're constantly forming groups and breaking up in groups. So uh, we didn't look at uh, group size uh, for any of these individuals. We we're just looking at that individual's locations for each of these. But uh, group size is a, is a rich area of research, and there's a lot of literature out there showing that group decisions are actually influencing individual decisions as well. So that wasn't really our focus here, but uh, it does influence their movement sometimes. I'm curious if you there's any data out there from the past of how much these bison in the Great Plains move. I mean, you're saying that they need more space, yep. but, and they have a nice population yep. in the Henry Mountains that they mm -hmm. like space. Yeah. Any clue previously? Yeah, I mean, these the, are moving, or are they just like, oh, the Texas and Oklahoma hang out there? And yeah, uh, the historical record there. isn't extremely clear. I mean, there's a lot of anecdotes out there of you know bison crossing, um, you know, whole cat, uh, whole. Um, 
uh, Pioneer trains being halted for days by bison just moving across the road and can't get across it. And as far as the eye can see, just bison running. Uh, so that alone explains, like, these are huge herds. That's a lot of space. Like, we don't know exactly how much it was. We just know it's a lot. And what we're doing is kind of taking those first steps towards trying to put a number on how much space is necessary to kind of replicate a similar subset of those interactions. Do you notice any differences on like the space used or the resources selected for between the genetically peer and the not genetically peer herds? Uh, so if we if we use a uh, management regime as kind of the, the proxy for that, uh, the Henry Mountains were using a lot more space, uh, but they were also free range but also genetically pure. Uh, but we didn't really look explicitly at the genetics uh, right. as an influence for movement and resource. So I was just wondering if you know. Yeah, yeah, that would be really interesting. If, you know, McDonald's out at Rams has more cattle, and maybe they're foraging more like cattle than like bison. But that's that's really a good point for uh, future work. Thank you.